Hi guys, uh, welcome back to our tobacco cessation webinar series. Uh, my name is Olivia. I'm a health educator for HIV and hepatitis C for the CATCH program, Community Action to Combat HIV and Hepatitis C for Argus Community. Um, we have been doing webinars on tobacco cessation as well as sexual health webinars. Um, our tobacco cessation ones have been every Tuesday from either 2 or the 6 p.m. And we have our sexual health webinars on Wednesday at 2 p.m. So today we will be continuing on with our tobacco cessation series uh, with the history of tobacco. So let's get started. Next slide, please, Sean. Okay, so our table of contents. So we split it up into three parts. So where did tobacco come from? The origins of tobacco um, and part of the European expansion, how it really came around the world. Uh, number two, we're gonna do the growing industry of tobacco, especially for the United States, how um, definitely had a big boom from the, both the world wars and uh, just the industrial revolution in general. And three, we're gonna do the recent past in tobacco cessation, um, how the health hazards were revealed about tobacco um, and how we're trying to rehabilitate others into quitting smoking or the use of tobacco. So next slide, please. So the overview and purpose is to understand how tobacco use came to be so popularized from being used in ancient medical practices to social scenes and pop culture. That this is the overview and purpose and what we want you to know after this webinar is over. Next slide, please. Okay, so where did tobacco come from? So there is documentation for tobacco use that goes over to 8,000 years ago. So this is around likely 5,000 BC with the development of maize-based agriculture in central Mexico. Um, the origins for tobacco use, because it's natively grown in the United States, that's where it comes from. Back, way back when, that's where it comes from, particularly here, not from Europe, which makes a lot of sense as as continue on from the series. Um, the origin of tobacco use came from religious ceremonies and medical purposes. So certain tribes in Eastern North America, they would have historically carried tobacco about like poaches as to accept for um, accepted trade items. They would use it for trade and um, that's how it kind of used as currency. Um, Tobacco would be smoked in traditional pipe ceremonies. So that would be for either sacred ceremonies for religious purposes, or they would smoke it in a pipe to either seal a treaty or an agreement. And tobacco was also used for addressing wounds and reducing pain. Um, so they would use that for earaches. I know for toothaches, they would actually chew the tobacco. Um, and some indigenous people in California still to this day will use tobacco as one ingredient and smoke it for treating colds. And it would be smoked with either sage or a cough fruit. And the reason why they use it in tobacco, they use tobacco for religious beliefs is because it, they had this belief that, you know, tobacco would carry one's thoughts and prayers to the spirits. Um, it was seen as a gift from the creator. So the use of tobacco is was very common in religious practices and it's still very common to this day, especially for the indigenous people uh, of America. Uh, it is seen as an offering to the creator uh, and it's still used as sweat logs and pipe ceremonies and still presented as a gift. And misuse of tobacco is actually very frowned upon by a lot of the tribes still currently. Um, and Native Americans, indigenous Americans are actually the biggest group of um, racial and ethnic populations that is actually affected by tobacco use the most. About, I think, I believe it's 22% of Native Americans are cigarette smokers in the United States. And they also are affected, heavy, heavily affected by the outcomes of tobacco use. So I should also mention that as well still. So next slide. So in, the late 15th century, Christopher Columbus was, gift, was gifted, quotation marks, uh, tobacco dried leaves exp and it expanded to all of Europe. Um, they ended up importing tobacco from the West Indies by the time when they started the European exp expansion. So it wasn't just from uh, America. Of the four plants of the Americas that spread to the world from the Columbus Exchange, so that was also potato, maize, tomato, and tobacco. Tobacco is the only one used in every country. 
other cultures such as Roman and Greeks had had encounters of smoking like hemp seeds and some other Spanish cultures had mentions of smoking lavender but at this time tobacco was still very unfamiliar territory to Europeans and that and because like I mentioned before it was naturally grown in the Americas. So again sailors would bring the tobacco and that's why it gained such a huge popularity in Europe for its supposed healing properties that I mentioned before and it was seen as a form of currency again from the 1620s and on. Um, tobacco fueled the colonization and became a driving factor in actually slavery. So the French, Portuguese, and the Spanish referred to tobacco as a sacred herb because of its medical properties. And it was believed to have magical healing powers and heavily promoted that everyone should take a daily dose of tobacco. Next slide, please. All right, so the negative effects. Um, Tobacco ended up expanding to recreational use, as I mentioned that a lot of people were doing daily doses of tobacco, but um, from what we learned, tobacco actually becomes highly addictive. So a lot of people who were smoking their daily doses ended up smoking for just much more than medical purposes. It was then uh, went on into recreational use. And by the early 17th century, so the 1600s, uh, scientists and philosophers were discovering the consequences of tobacco use, such as the difficulty of breathing. And the main problem was that people were having trouble quitting. Uh, King James I of English, he published his pamphlet on like a counter blast to tobacco. So he essentially just really hated tobacco. He kept saying it was hateful to the nose, harmful to the brain, and dangerous to the lungs. Uh, one of the first laws that were actually made uh, smoking in public illegal was in 1632, and it was in the colony of Massachusetts, which they passed a law making smoking, a, smoking in public illegal. This probably had more to do with um, moral beliefs than actual health concerns, because at this time there weren't that many uh, health concerns or a lot of research backing that tobacco was bad. They just have learned that some people were having trouble breathing and it was having trouble quitting. Um, once tobacco use started to grow, scientists then began to study further and understand the chemicals in tobacco and the harmful effects. So like we said before, there was not that much research at this time. So that's why it's more led to believe that the first law for smoking in public to be made illegal was probably more for moral beliefs. And in 1760, uh, Pierre Lollard, he established the first company that processed tobacco to make cigars and snuff. And this was and is the oldest tobacco company in the United States. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is um, part two, like I mentioned before, the growing industry of tobacco. Uh, Tobacco became a very integral part into the United States growth. It helped finance the American Revolution. So in order to pay for its significant expenses during the revolution, Congress had two options. They either print or obtain loans to meet the de budget deficit. So when you print more money, it leads to a hyperinflation. And because the American people were actually fighting in a, in a war to oppose uh, <laughs> taxation and unjust taxation, Congress didn't want to increase people's taxes at all. So after the fighting between the Americans and the British ended in 1783. The new United States government established under the Articles of Confederation that they need to pay off its debt, but lacked sufficient tax authority to secure any revenue. So of course, this is where tobacco comes in and solves America's pro new America's problems. Um, the U.S. required a lot of revenue through trading tobacco with Europe, but because it's depleted the nutrients in the soil, it only lasts for about three years or so before they start turning to other crops to trade. So that's why it was, became much bigger things. So they, that's how they started to expand more with trading and building up the U.S. So scientists in about nine, in the 18th century, they found that nicotine in its purest form, and they deemed it to be absolutely poisonous. Nicotine was first isolated from tobacco leaves in 1828 by two German chemists, uh, Willem Henrik Pulsett and Karl Ludwig Ren Renman, Renman, I should say. Um, it was structured to be determined in 18, its structure would be determined in 1893, and would be first synthesized, synthesized in 1904 nicotine, I mean. Um, by the early 17th century, all these philosophers and scientists, again, were discovering the consequences, consequences with smoking tobacco that they had on actual lives. So that was much more now 
before the troubled with breathing and quitting smoking. They're finding more research in depth that does a lot more to the body than those two things. More, as this is going on um, with the industrial revolution, more and more companies are establishing tobacco, like uh, tobacco companies are being more established. Like I mentioned, the Pierre Lalorde, um, it wasn't, but it wasn't until the 19 hundreds um, that cigarettes, which is the most popular uh, tobacco product, were actually made and sold as a major tobacco product in the United States. A lot of it was snuff, a lot of it was cigars and more for pipe smoking, but it wasn't really until the 1900s that cigarettes were made. In 1901, 3.5 billion cigarettes were sold in the United States and more and more tobacco companies were established after that, so the entire industry gained a lot of power after that, especially with the birth of the modern cigarette, which the one we know more so now is from 1913. So it's been about a hundred years of people smoking very similar cigarettes. The way the cigarette looks now is very similar to the one back in 1913. So next slide, please. So like I mentioned before about how the um, the wars have heavily affected uh, the growth of tobacco use in the United States. World War I and World War II had a very big impact on uh, cig the cigarette, uh, cigarettes being the most used tobacco product in the United States. Um, it exploded during World War I because cigarettes were called the soldier smoke. Uh, so free or subsidized brands were distributing tr uh, to troops um, all these types of cigarettes for them to use. So the demand for cigarettes in, New York, in North America had been roughly doubled every five years. So it began to rise even faster and almost tripled during the four years of war. So in the face of intimate violent death, the health harms of cigarettes became less of a concern about people. And it was just more of a public support for the drives to just get the cigarettes to the front lines. And it was seen as unpatriotic actually to not give soldiers cigarettes. So a lot of private donors started donating cigarettes and returning soldiers then continued to smoke, making smoking more socially acceptable. Um, you can, next slide, please. So again, like I mentioned before, it was at an all time high. Um, and again, tobacco companies kept sending cigarettes to soldiers for free. Um, at the time, women were starting to go into the workforce, and so they were seen smoking on the job. There were a lot of tobacco companies now that were trying to target women to an increase of their smoking population because a lot of it, like I mentioned before, soldiers were getting a lot of the attention from tobacco companies to send it off. So now they kind of want to expand it to um, another gender, women, and that's where they did it. They kind of geared it towards more um, campaigning with, you know, pretty women in the in posters and um, seeing it as more socially acceptable for women now that they're going on to work. Um, they're more socially acceptable to smoke cigarettes like the men. And during the 1950s, more and more evidence was surfacing that smoking was linked to lung cancer. Even though the tobacco industry denied all these hazards, they promoted new products which were seen as safer, but that doesn't necessarily really mean it was safer. It was just had lower tar and filtered cigarettes. There's no actual evidence backing, backing it that it was safer. All right, um, next slide, please. So um, in 1963, yearly per capita consumption of cigarettes in the United States reached its peak uh, at 4,336 cigarettes per person, which are equal to more than a pack a day for each person every, uh, every two days. So after the World War, um, cigarette companies were actually heavily advertising on TV. So Camel Cigarettes was sponsored by the nation's first regular television news program, Camel News Caravan. It was featured on uh, featured an ashtray on the desk in front of the newscaster, uh, John Cameron Swayze, and the Camel logo was right behind them. So this was a 15 minute news show that ran from 1949 to 1956. So there was a lot of still campaigning uh, and using the new outlet of TV to really force the drive in tobacco industry. 
Um, and there was a lot of evidence now that we mentioned after the World War II, um, there was a lot of evidence now that was leading up to um, health hazards of cigarettes. So um, in January 1952, Hammond and Horn engaged 22,000 American Cancer Society volunteers to help recruit a large group of Americans aged 50 to 69 across 10 U.S. states and ask these men about their smoking habits. So following the men for about 20 months, uh, both scientists and doctors had enough information to publish what they called the preliminary findings in August 7, 1954 Journal of the American Medical Association article. So the conclusion was very clear. It was found that these men with a history of regular cigarette smoking uh, have considerably higher death rate than men who have never smoked or men who've only smoked cigar cigars or pipes. Um, so this is kind of the biggest conclusion. And they also realized that the higher death rate in smokers was due to primarily either heart disease and cancers. So death from cancer were definitely associated with regular cigarette smoke. So they called out lung cancer in particular. Uh, the death rate from lung cancer was much higher among men with a history of regular cigarette smoking than those who've never smoked regularly. So this is very big information. Like we mentioned before, there wasn't that much research on cigarette smoking and tobacco use, but now they have full evidence and a survey of that, an experiment I should say, that they surveyed all these men who have noticed that there is a huge uh, impact on tobacco use in the body for smoke, smoking cigarettes, um, that it leads to cancer and eventually uh, early death. In 1963, so like I mentioned before, this is when people were smoking each day every two days they were smoking at least a pack a day. Um, and in 1964, this is when the Surgeon's General's report on smoking and health, uh, which is the first that many really came out and kind of shined light to all the negative uh, health effects that I mentioned before, uh, it came to the public. So um, it shows the negative effects of cigarette smoking. So it helps the government initiate regulation and the sale of cigarettes. Like I mentioned before, the one uh, experiment that I talked about was 10 years before that the Surgeon General actually came to the public. So a lot of people did uh, have the information, but it wasn't really made to the public and for the government to actually step in and make these regulations. So it was only 10 years after that um, experiment happened. So um, on the basis of more than 7,000 articles um, relating to smoking and disease already available at the time, uh, the advisor at the time in the biomedical literature, he concluded that cigarette smoking is a cause of lung cancer and laryngeal cancer in men, a probable cause of lung cancer in women, and it's the most important cause of chronic bronchitis. So the U.S. Congress adopted the Federal Cigarette Labeling and Advertising Act and the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act of 1969, uh, which made these laws require a health warning on cigarette packages, a banned a cigarette advertising and broadcasting media, called for an annual report on the health consequences of smoking. Um, and in 1965, the Public Health Service established a small unit called the National Clearinghouse for Smoking and Health. And at this time, um, cig like I mentioned before about the Camel Show, uh, the television cigarette ads were actually taken off the air in Great Britain across the pond. And in 1966, those health warnings on cigarette pack packages just began popping up. Uh, beginning in 1967, the Federal Communications Commission utilized a provision of its fairness doctrine that required all TV stations to broadcast one anti-smoking public service announcement, so at no cost to the organizations providing them for every three cigarette ads they aired. The anti-smoking announcements would soon prove effective as the number of smokers then began to decrease very quickly. Um, 1970. 1970, President Nixon also signed the Public Health Cigarette Smoking Act, which bans cigarette ads from airing on television and radio. The, however, though, the ban only took effect January 2nd, 1971. So the final smoking advertisement would actually play during the New Year's Day College Bowl games. So this was the last televised cigarette ad, and it ran at 11.50 p.m. during the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. So even though there was a television ban, like I mentioned, in the advertising, uh, for advertising, um, cigarette advertising continued to appear in newspapers, billboards, and magazines. And it wasn't really until the 1990s that the cigarette billboards were replaced with anti-smoking messages. Okay, so next slide, please. 
So one thing I wanted to mention was the target on minors. Like I mentioned, there were so many um, ads taking place and so many health regulations for a lot of people to stop smoking. Um, there was a huge still thing that was um, a lot of tobacco companies were now trying to target um, minors and a different demographic of people um, because they were losing a very stead, steady group of population. So in the 1980s, the health, the health consequences of smoking for women reported that the annual risk for death from all causes is 80 to 90% greater among women who smoke cigarettes than among women who have never smoked. Um, a woman's annual risk for death is more than doubles um, among continuing smokers compared to someone who has never smoked in every age group between 45 years through 74 years. And since 1980, there's approximately 3 million U.S. women who have died prematurely from smoking related, um, a smoking-related disease. So from 1983 to 1990, this is where the tobacco companies really did that push for tobacco use on the youth. They tried to make it look cool. So a lot of celebrities and pop and all pop culture and media, they would try to keep it in the movies. So when kids would see it, um, they would have the desire that smoking made them look a lot cooler than uh, not smoking did. So the minimum age of buying cigarettes was raised from 16 to 18 in the 19 in 1990 because of this, because of there was a big population of minors who were buying uh, cigarettes for to make them look cool. And then they would, of course, um, start getting addicted to the nicotine and develop these start developing health problems that would lead on to their later careers in life. Um, in 1992, um, the Signer Amendment to Alcohol, Drug Abuse, and Mental Health Administration Reorg uh, Reorganization Act. This required states to enact laws prohibiting the sale of and distribution of tobacco products to minors. And this was in 1992. And of course, um, not just minors, but during the 80s and 90s, the tobacco industry started to market heavily in areas outside the US. So this is a lot of developing countries in Asia. Um, and by this time, Marlboro, which we all very much know as a very popular tobacco brand, they're considered the most valuable brand of any product with a value over $30 billion. So over this period, there was actually a battle between Coca-Cola and Marlboro as the number one brand in the world, which is absolutely insane. So there was carbonated drinks on one side and tobacco fighting for the number one spot. Next slide, please. Okay, so the new millennial. Uh, the Oregon Clean Air Act, uh, which was an act that prohibited smoking to public areas, including educational facilities, and prohibited any person under the age of 18 to possess tobacco products on school grounds, in school facilities, or at school-sponsored activities. So this was very important for us because uh, it just made smoking in public illegal. Kind of comes from the law that I mentioned um, previously uh, in, in the colony in Massachusetts where they made smoking and public illegal like that was for moral reasons but this is obviously for a public health concern so we've definitely come a long way in those 400 years but um, it clearly made a message that to a lot of people that smoking is really not okay for the body um, but this opened up a door for e-cigs. So in 2004, e-cigs were introduced to the global market. In about 2003, a Chinese pharmacist, uh, Hong Leek, was credited with the first generational e-cigarette and invented the e-cigarette as a safer and cleaner way to inhale nicotine as a tobacco cessation resource. And he actually created this product after his father passed away from lung cancer. Um, by 2004, uh, Hong Leek introduced e-cigarettes to the Chinese market through his employer, the Golden Dragon Holdings, but it didn't actually officially hit American market, even though it hit most of the global market. It didn't hit the American market until about, I would say, 2007. Um, and also in 2000, 2006, like I mentioned, tobacco companies were liable for marketing to children. So now they're actually having consequences to uh, actually physically acting on marketing to children and getting them to buy their products. Um, and along with in 2007, not only did the e-cigarettes hit the market for America, um, this is when they did a lot of research on low income housing uh, markets for 
tobacco. 72% uh, of smokers are from lower income communities. And this is actually no accident because the big tobacco companies were targeting these communities to start smoking and it made them harder for them to stop with products designed to be more addictive. So tobacco companies would actually hand out free cigarettes to children in housing projects. They would issue tobacco coupons with food stamps and explored giving away financial products like prepaid debit cards. So today, several major tobacco industry practices contribute to the high smoking rates in low income communities and included more retailers and more advertising. So it discounted and keeping prices low and increasing the addiction for over the past 50 years. This really came to light in the early 2000s. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is um, the thing about e-cigarettes. So we noticed in the past couple of years that e-cigarettes have had a huge market with the younger generation and adolescents and even minors. So um, they have major tobacco companies that have purchased or developed e-cigarettes. Uh, include uh, Loyola, the Pierre Loyola. They acquired Blue, which is the leading e-cigarette brand in the United States. Altria, which actually owns Marlboro, acquired Green Smoke and has its own Mark 10 brand. And another one, Reynolds, created its own brand, uh, brand Views. So also the British American Tobacco Company sells Vipe, Imperial Tobacco sells Reuven, Swisher sells E-Swisher. See, all these companies are coming around with new brands. One that's very popular is the Jewel um, that now uh, Altria also acquired uh, after this big thing in the news, I believe it was last year or the year before, um, where children, like kids were having severe lung damage because of the smoking of the E6 because they weren't necessarily, they didn't know what they were smoking. There's such little research on e-cigarettes um, that kids were developing a lot of lung, lung failures, lung diseases, uh, some were, temporary acute and some were really long-term chronic so um, a lot of these tobacco companies actually use that push to do the anti e-cigarettes to really grab on to those brands and make them their own and stop it because i feel like it's been noted that once altria bought um jewel that there was no slander from those companies and they really were promoting it as much as they could so it was definitely an interesting switch for that. But e-cigarettes, there's still no research on that much research, except for what we know that even though it doesn't have tobacco itself, it still is very dangerous to the lungs and to the throat because of all the aerosols that you're putting in your body. Um, obviously there has been such a big thing with cigarette smoking and there is more uh, tobacco cessation resources and you know they're teaching a lot of younger kids at earlier on the dangers of tobacco use that it does help affect the new generation for um doing better and not damaging themselves with all these products but you know there are still a lot of people who you know do need the help um which is where we come in as a staff next slide please um so as a staff, we also, you know, do post pre and post test counseling. Uh, we do provide resources, like I mentioned, for tobacco cessation. So if you are someone who is interested in our, um, just interested in quitting smoking, or you know someone who is uh, interested in quitting smoking, we do have uh, resources for you that might be more um, convenient for you based on your location and whatnot. So we do have those resources as well as sexual health resources, uh, sexual health clinics. Um, you know, if you would like a GIFRA, which is a Government Performance and Results Act, we also connect you, like I mentioned before, we're the CATCH program, Community Action to Combat HIV and Hepatitis C. We connect clients to HIV and Hepatitis C medical services. We can connect clients to substance use services, including smoking cessation, like I mentioned before. And we can also connect you to mental health services, local pantries, and um, assist in uninsured individuals to get access to the medical insurance. One particular person on our team who um, does this and is very fabulous at it is um, our behavioral coordinator, Christopher Olin. Next slide, please. And this is our 
regular staff for the Art Tobacco Associations. Uh, like I mentioned before, my name is Olivia Duffy. I'm a health educator. Um, I also do a podcast with uh, the Catch Program called the Catch Program Podcast, along with my coworker who's also on the screen, Yamina Castillo, with our uh, wonderful technical coordinator, Sean Belgrave. So if you were very interested in this webinar, you could always go to our social media platforms, which are all Argus Catch. Um, our Instagram is Argus Catch New York, but everything will be linked down below. Below, We also have a linked tree with all of our information. So we do have our YouTube, um, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and we do have a registration for all of our Eventbrite events. So be sure to check that out because we also do a, like I mentioned before, a sexual health webinar every Wednesday at two uh, with some of our wonderful coworkers that are not listed on the slides, but um, that is um, Stacy Britton, uh, <laughs> Nicholas Catalafino, correct? And then um, Loletta Brown. So be sure to check that out as well. So thank you guys so much for joining us today and we hope to hear from you soon. So next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide. And this is our information. If you have any questions, please email us here. Um, that is our phone number, our regular email, and that is our Argus community website, as long with the link tree that I mentioned before. So thank you guys so much, and I hope you guys have a wonderful day.